My name is Emma Spett, and my concentration is titled Environmental and Conservation Science. Tonight, I'm going to tell you about the way that I've broken down the complicated and inter interdisciplinary act of environmental problem solving. Behind me is a photograph called Earth Threats. It was taken in 1968 by Captain Jim Lovell of the Apollo 8 mission, which was the first manned mission to the moon. Jim Lovell describes this photo as evoking vast loneliness when you realize just how much you have back there on Earth. And it's become a symbolic image within the environmental movement, because every place, every person, and everything that we've ever known is contained within one photograph. We're all riding on that spaceship together. I've been an environmentalist my entire life. I grew up on a farm in New Jersey, spent the majority of my childhood outside, and when I was in high school, I fell in with a group of environmental activists who forever doomed me to carry the weight of the world on my shoulders. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> In 2010, I had the opportunity to travel with a group of American high school students to the Himalayas of northern India. While there, I was tremendously inspired by the local environment, so much so that it remains a focal point of my research to this day. I'm currently examining how rural agrarian farmers in Ladakh can successfully adapt to climate change. When I got to college, I wanted to take courses and participate in experiences that would contribute to an arsenal of skills that would allow me to effectively tackle and solve a vast array of environmental problems from illegal trash dumping in my hometown, to deforestation of the rainforest, to even global climate change. The question that's guided me over the past four years, which I hope in part to answer for you all tonight, is what does it take to bring about substantial and sustainable environmental change? This is a loaded question. Environmental problem solving requires economic, environmental, social, political, and cultural dimensions. And so I've broken it down into four major considerations that we have to go through if we want to solve any environmental problem. The conservationist toolkit. The first consideration are the ecological interactions and processes in play. We have to address the core scientific issues behind the environmental problem we're trying to address. The second thing we need to do is examine the social relationship to nature that the region in question has. What does the local relationship to nature look like? Is it informed by decision makers in a political sphere? or is it informed by local culture? The third consideration is framing the present. What does the world we currently live in look like? And how do global phenomena impact these local environments? And finally, we have to investigate conservation schemes that are already in the works so that we can learn and draw from them. So let's start with the science. A good place to start when you're investigating the science behind any environmental issue is with the carbon cycle. All living things are made of carbon. Not to mention our oceans, our atmosphere, and our land is comprised of carbon. In an ideal world, we would exist in balance with the carbon cycle. Living things like us would give off carbon dioxide and methane, and it would be absorbed by carbon sinks like our oceans and our rainforests. But at the turn of the 19th century, we started industrializing, and we started emitting fossil fuel, or we started burning fossil fuels and emitting additional carbon dioxide into our atmosphere. Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas, which means it traps um, heat within our atmosphere and keeps the planet ideally a warm and habitable place. But this overload of carbon dioxide has led to the warming phenomenon that we now know as climate change. So the science is important. Why are the glaciers in the Himalayas melting at an increased rate? How did sea level rise contribute to the damaging nature of Hurricane Sandy in New York City? Without understanding the science, you can't expect to develop a good solution. The second consideration that's essential for environmental problem solving is understanding the social context of the region that you're working in. In the United States, conservation has long been dictated by our collective relationship to nature, which is represented by the ideals of individuals making conservation decisions. Behind me are two charismatic figures from the Amer American conservation movement. The guy in the hat is President Teddy Roosevelt, champion of the American National Parks and bona fide moose rider. <laughs> And next to him is his friend Gifford Pinchot, who was the first chief of the United States Forest Service. Teddy and Gifford represent the preservationist perspective that long dominated conservation rhetoric in the United States. They think that nature should be separate from the humans and the destruction that we have the capacity to initiate. And thus they led to the, to the initiation of the American park system in the United States, which is great. Um, Teddy and Gifford were ironic figures, though, because they fall into the field of practical environmentalists, which means that while they advocate for the preservation of wild places, they were also pretty okay with the destruction of everything else in the name of economic development. <laughs> we currently utilize the conservationist perspective primarily in conservation rhetoric around the world today. Behind me is Aldo Leopold, who's an icon of American conservation, as well as an author and an ecologist. 
He wrote that there are some who can live without wild things and some who cannot. Aldo Leopold is representative of this conservationist perspective, which strives to facilitate harmonious existence between humans and nature. When I was conducting research in India, I had to examine the social relationship that the Ladakhi people had to nature. Rather than having these large figureheads dictate their relationship, their culture, which was primarily Tibetan Buddhist, as well as their livelihoods, which was traditional agrarian farmers, dictated how they interacted with nature and became a core facet of my research in understanding local perceptions of nature. The third consideration is framing the present. What does the world we live in look like? Scientists are currently pushing for the acknowledgement that we've moved into a new geological epoch, or period. Past geological epochs have been defined by significant natural processes. The difference with the Anthropocene is that it names humans as the major geological force on Earth. We have impacted nearly every nat natural process that occurs on the planet. Behind me are a series of graphs, and each one of them has a steep upward trend. That is what characterizes the Anthropocene. Some of those graphs include increased temperature, increased carbon dioxide emissions, increased and growing human population, as well as increased McDonald's change around the world. <laughs> the Anthropocene is characterized by unprecedented growth in nearly every sector of existence. And a major product of the Anthropocene is climate change, which is the fast-paced transformation of ecological systems, which has led to increased temperature, around the world, sea level rise, as well as extreme weather events. A professor of mine once told me that it was not as descriptive to call this phenomenon global warming as it was to call it global weirding. <laughs> so how do these global phenomena play into the issue that we're interested in solving? Is it necessary to consider climate change and other global ecological uh, degradation when we're considering any type of environmental problem around the world? Technically, yes. The last thing we need to do is devise a plan. And we can learn a lot from conservation schemes that have happened around the world. In the United States and parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, national parks which have excluded local communities from interacting with their local environments has seemed effective in the pursuit of preserving uh, charismatic megafauna, um, as well as ecosystems and ecotourism industries. On a larger scale, international agreements like the Montreal Protocol have been effective in limiting the emissions of chlorofluorocarbons, which are found in refrigerants and aerosols. Chlorofluorocarbons were deemed responsible for the growing ozone hole over the Antarctic in the 1980s, and currently the ozone hole has been significantly reduced. Uh, when you're dealing with local communities, it's significant to examine conservation schemes like community-based conservation, which seeks to involve the entire community in the process of conserving natural resources. When I was conducting research in India, local college students wanted to be a part of my interview process, as you can see behind me. They were invested just as much as the older agrarian farmers were in moving towards a climate change adapted society. The diagnosis of a problem and the prescription of a pollution, be it in the Himalayas of northern India, the suburbs of New Jersey, or even the entire planet, presents the challenge of considering a problem within both a hyper-localized and a global perspective simultaneously. And here's an additional challenge. In the face of increased industrialization, consumption and growth, as well as rapid environmental degradation, it's essential that we solve these problems right the first time. That's why I've broken it down into a series of steps. It seems daunting to have to interact with all of these different fields, but when we break it down, it becomes nothing more than a series of questions we need to answer that have the ability to generate innovative and creative solutions to some of the most time-sensitive and large-scale problems that the world has ever seen. It seems complicated, and it is. The task is daunting, but it's not hard to do when you remember just how much we have to lose. The way that our generation prepares itself to deal with some of the most child environmental challenges that we've inherited will determine the trajectory of humankind's working relationship to nature. And that's not a job I take lightly. Thank you.